Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome to another Truth Factor Discussion. On today's Truth Factor Discussion, we're going to pick up in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, right around verse 10. And so, be you have your Bibles open. We'll get there in just a few minutes. I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us for our weekly Bible study. Hopefully, you're benefiting from this. I know that we are. Um, one of the main reasons we like to do these studies is for our own self-benefit. And I don't mean self-promotion, but self-benefit because we gain a lot from studying together. And hopefully we can share that with you also. Gentlemen, it's good to see everyone with us today. It looks like, well, not everybody. We don't have Brandon here. He tried to pop in for a couple of minutes there, but his um, mobile earbuds weren't cooperating with him. But he's, he's away from us today. Uh, Brian, how are things going up in your neck of the woods there in Oregon? Well, fantastic. I was just telling you guys earlier that I had a bit of an internet issue yesterday whenever my puppy, uh, that eagle puppy of mine, chewed right through my internet ethernet cord and ended my show. So, you know, um, he tried to sabotage me, but we've overcome. I would say something about the devil possessing him to do that, but yeah, yeah we won't I, say that. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, things going out in Indiana still? Yeah, we're fine. Uh, we've had uh, we had a really severe storm come through uh, here last Friday and mm -hmm. uh, took out several houses. A tornado uh, went just north of my current location, and uh, appreciate any prayers on behalf of those. Some of them were Christians from a nearby congregation, and some folks were without power for about a week. And so, um, we're thankful that. Uh, we were safe and uh, just uh, there was one family from that was camping at a nearby state park uh, that's about 10 minutes away uh, that was killed. They were uh, from the Lafayette, Indiana Church of Christ, Crazy Lane Church of Christ. Oh, no. And um, he was a deacon with that congregation and uh, he and his wife were killed. Their truck and camper were uh, torn to pieces. And so uh, just uh, pray for those. I know there was devastation in other states as well, uh, but those situations have not recovered. So please keep all those folks in your prayers. Uh, you don't even have to know the names because God does. That's right. Yeah. Well, I hate to hear that. And definitely keep in our prayers. And Tom, how about you in Southern California? Oh, oh things are going well here. We're actually getting ready for a gospel meeting this coming Sunday. Uh, yeah, so I guess if you are in Southern California, I'll go ahead and make the plug. Uh, we are, uh, uh, J.R. Bronger is going to be speaking for us, and uh, it is a Sunday through Thursday meeting. He has to fly out Friday to another location. So that's this week. Uh, you can go to our website, roseavenue.org, and the details are there. So if you're in the area, we'd love to have you. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our study. Like I said, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 10. If you have joined us on our Facebook page and you're watching the live video stream through there, then you can use the comment section. Some have already done that to um, offer your thoughts, comments, or internet help. Guys, I don't know if you saw that. There's an expert in the chat room. Um, and so he's he willing to, to reach out to you and, and help you there. Um, I don't think that's a, a worldwide offer from everybody, but you know, it's for the four of y'all and well, for three of y'all. And, um, if you joined us on our YouTube side of things, you'll see the chat area for that. And you could make your questions and comments there. We'd love to hear from you. Ab absolutely. Let us hear from you. But so where we're picking up today in Ecclesiastes chapter eight in verse 10 and in this section fundamentally if we were to kind of summarize this particular 10 through 13 we'd be talking about how that those who fear god ultimately will do well but one of the things we'll see as we go through this whole section is there's not some special um i'm not sure what i'm trying to say but there's no guarantee that the Christians, the faithful of God, will prosper and the wicked will fail. We'll talk about this a little, little bit later here, that everything happens to everybody. But the assurances that the followers of God have has to do with the assurances that will come after this life. And um, that's what gives us hope and focus there. So let's go ahead and start. And Paul, let's start with you, if you would. 
let me get this prepped. Let's start reading and let's read verses 10 through 13. And what translation will you be reading out? Of? I can go ahead and use. I've got uh, I've got a couple Bibles laying open here, but I can go ahead and use the uh, New King James. All righty then. Make it easy on well, you. Well, I appreciate the thought about that. So, and there we go. <clears throat> are you ready? Whenever you are, sir. Okay. Ecclesiastes 8, uh, 10 through 13. Then I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times, and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he does not fear before God. Okay. So, when we come back up to this section there, Paul, going back up to verse 10, it is it is interesting. All right, so in his phrase there, then I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had done so. This also is vanity. There's an interesting Bible story of an individual who was a servant of God who died, but was kind of forgotten until he was not forgotten years later under the time period of Josiah. And you know, ultimately what he's talking about here is going to have the idea of that life is going to happen, and if you do wicked, you'll die. People will forget about you. If you do righteous, you'll die. People forget about you, but you're not going to escape the punishment. you remember who that person was? I don't. I, the unnamed the, um, man of God? That's right. First Kings 13. Yeah, that young prophet. Um, he had gone and prophesied against uh, Joab. or Je Yeah, no, Jeroboam. Pre prophesied against the altar there. And um, let's see. Let me do one thing. I was thing thinking, I don't what? remember the name, but. Uh, yeah, no, he didn't have his name. We didn't have his name. But he, yeah. he prophesied. He said, one day a guy named Josiah is going to show up, and he's going to, yep. uh, you know, break this altar. And uh, and then, of course, later Josiah takes up the bones of the, of the priests and burns them on the altar. Does he not? Am I remembering that accurately? He does. And what's interesting is, and someone says, well, what about these bones? And they are told they are the bones of the one that prophesied against this. Leave those unharmed, or you know, leave them where they were. Mm -hmm. um, and do you remember as a bonus question, who was buried with, or at least was supposedly buried with Josiah? Or with Josiah, or with the man of God, uh, with the man of God. I mean, yeah, the old man of God. Yeah, uh, also unnamed. Yeah. yeah, so the old man of God that lied to him uh, and got him yeah. killed. He said, "Bury him with me." Yeah, which got me. That's in, an interesting story. Which got me in trouble the other night. We were talking about this, and our our Tuesday night home Bible study. We were studying the Kings, and uh, talking about him being buried, wanting to be buried with the young prophet. And I said, "Well, if I was going to be buried with my wife, we would need to be a, have a big coffin." And I meant just for space between each other, and it, it wasn't quite taken that way. <laughs> so, uh, John, this verse, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's just a reality there. Uh, there are some folks who are remembered, maybe, uh, you know, history remembers them. But for most of us, whatever good we've done, no matter how righteously and holy we've lived uh, and and whatever uh, great things we've accomplished, uh, that our name is not going to go down in the annals of history as uh, some uh, memorable person. Uh, and it may be that we impacted a lot of lives, did a lot of good pleased God, and God will remember us in eternity. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's right. But in the course of human events, uh, it is unlikely that most of us, that the memory is going to be there more than a couple of generations. I was joking with one of my children one time, so you know that I have a, um, have a website where I do silly things uh, in the past. I need to get maybe back to that at some point. But uh, And I told uh, my daughter, I said, now you need to make sure that you pay the uh, annual fee to keep that website going after I'm gone because you know everyone will want to remember me for uh, for that and it was just a joke because it's uh, it's just probably not for most of us that's probably just not going to happen 
Yeah, yeah. Despite our technology, we haven't yet gone through an age where things are going to be memorable for the majority of the people. Remember, I should say, for 500 years. Most everybody's forgotten in history, unless you somehow or another made a mark or something. Um, right, right, yeah. Yeah, Paul, you got what, four subscribers on that site? Uh, now I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you would subscribe, so, Tom, we would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, let's yeah. let's come on right, to you, you know, it, Yeah. Just just real quick. Just go ahead. real quick observation. He was talking about the, you know, nobody remembers the 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 righteous or so on. The same thing is true as the text says. The wicked also. Yeah. You know, those that are are caught up in evil, they may be they may have an influence right now, but not for long. You yeah. Know, and, that's right. Uh, but but by the way, the 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 their influence whether you remember their names or not, a lot of times it does have an impact. It does, yeah. Now, something he brings out here in verse 11, and, and it kind of goes into verse 12 there as well, is that um, oftentimes what, what continues to feed wickedness in people is the lack of consequences for their deeds, okay? There are some people, they'll do something wrong, something wicked, if you would, and immediately receive consequences and, and will change. But some people view, well, nothing bad has happened yet as some measure of acceptance there. And that's what he kind of talks about there in verse 11 of the text. So let me pop over there real quick, where he says, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore this heart of the sons of men is fully set on them to do evil. And so though a sinner does a hundred evil things, uh, does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged yet I surely know and here comes the point that it will be well with those who fear God who fear before him and that provides us a great deal of comfort when it comes to our lives as Christians um, knowing that no matter what happens for those who serve God it will be well yes Tom go ahead yeah yeah you know I mean uh, you know, you talk about this as we look at individuals and stuff, and that's probably the overall context. But this is true from a societal standpoint, too. And and, and I, I genuinely believe that one of the reasons, one of the reasons we are drifting further away from God is because we've removed consequences for evil behavior and for, mm. you know, for criminal behavior and whatever. And, and I mean, we live in a society where where literally it could take years and years and years just to just to try something or you know you know to get it established that way, and and as a result of that, people just get caught up in evil, uh, engage evil, and and they they just keep doing it. And, and I mean, uh, you've got those that you know you talk about the sinner does evil a hundred times in our society. That I think that's happening all over the place. You know, where people are just devoted to evil behavior, whatever it is in their life, and, and they're getting away with it. I mean, and literally getting away with it. And uh, and it's frustrating to the righteous, you know, you know, when you're trying to serve God. And in a lot of cases, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I think of in the New Testament where, you know, we're told over there in uh, 1 Timothy to pray for, you know, pray for our leaders and so on. And I've, I've kind of started reminding people in that text there that what we're supposed to be praying for is that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life. You know, and, and, and I think honestly, in an ungodly world, that's the best that we can expect. But it's still so frustrating to see righteousness villainized the way that it is. But we're reminded here that, you know what, God knows what's going on and and, uh, you know, the wicked may get away with it over and over and over and over and over in this life. But he's going to stand before God, and unless he's taken care of it, there's going to be a day of reckoning. That's right. And Brian, there in verse 13, he tells us fundamentally at the end of it why this is the case about the yeah. wicked persisting. Yeah, what I think is really interesting here, um, something I kind of hadn't caught in this text before uh, that uh, as we started studying it uh, really struck out at me is that this whole chapter is kind of a commentary out of Romans 13. So let's take uh, verse 2 
And let's say verse 2 ties us over to Romans 13 and our obligation to respect civil authority and that that's a case of righteousness before God. Well, one of the underlying themes that doesn't get answered in Romans 13 is, but what about injustice? In other words, uh, human government is human. It's almost, well, almost, it's always flawed. Sometimes it's flawed terribly. Sometimes it seems like the wicked get away with things and such. And I never really caught before that this answers that. This is kind of the, hey, you know, yeah, in human terms, the wicked might get away with things, but ultimately, uh, you know, he says, verse 13, the wicked are going to get justice before God. I mean, that's the real justice. It's not It's not the government that's the truest justice. It's actually God that's the truest justice. And that's also to say that the righteous will get their reward because that's the truest justice. So I'd never really thought about this before, but, you know, and Tom kind of was alluding to it too, but this really answers a big question out of Romans 13. What do we do about when there's injustice and the government doesn't work? And and even that, I, I really thought that verse uh, 11 was a neat comment to say, hey, by the way, one reason there's injustice is the government doesn't act. You know, uh, um, up here in the Pacific Northwest, that's a, actually a pretty big um, political debate. I don't want to get into that, but about whether or not our, you know, some of our district attorneys are doing their job and prosecuting people. And I never really thought about this before, but this this verse is them. This is the... You know, the the long the less you act, the more the the you know the evil doer does evil, and and we see that in society, and it's just a really uh, profound statement that we catch here. But I but I'd never really seen this before. That here we have a commentary that says, "Hey, uh, 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 understood. There isn't always justice, but there really is, um, and you shouldn't worry about it. You shouldn't live your life fretting about that injustice because you know in the end, God will take care of these things." What you should do is find enjoyment in your life. You know, don't don't get caught up in worrying about injustice. You know, this is the the verse fifteen admonition. So, yeah. How do you guys think point. this uh, works in terms of uh, thinking about uh, God's justice that is not immediate, at least not always immediate? Um, you know, we see uh, Ananias and Sapphira who were punished virtually immediately. Uh, and it says fear came upon, you know, the church. And, and But, you know, today we realize that if we, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to tempt God here, uh, but generally speaking, if, if we or people in general uh, choose to do evil, uh, their judgment is not immediate. It is, mm-hmm. uh, it is put off, I guess. Maybe it shows us what great confidence we need to have in the justice of God, that He will punish or reward, but not immediately. So, I don't know. Well, think about the seven, the six things that um, that God hates: seven that are abomination that in Proverbs. Just take those seven things for a moment. Imagine what our lives, our lives, would be like if the Lord struck us with lightning every time that happened you know if the lord took some sort of immediate consequence on us how would we handle that i I guess there is a sense in which there can be immediate consequences and not saying he strikes us with a lightning uh but um but that you know in terms of our fellowship with him and having the the blessings of uh, knowing that we're faithful to him and things like that but i'm just saying a a judgment Mm -hmm that is pronounced, um, it, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, it would, uh, well, to answer your question, you know, I, I won't try to answer for the rest of these, but of course I'd be literally toast. So I'm same here. Yeah. For those watching online, yeah. I am getting some flags here, um, on my software that we are having some streaming issues. So I'm not, quite sure so if it starts buffering just kind of um hang on and stay with us and if if we're able to we'll um well we'll keep going as is and i'm recording it just in case hopefully john i've got uh, i've got the stream up and it is uh choppy and buffering uh just checking it here and and is it possible we have a beagle somewhere chewing on something i can we can go look into that you know if you give him your power cord to chew on it will stop the problem well, right. I'll do just that. He did chew up a power cord, by the way, the other day. <laughs> Didn't stop. Hmm. 
Well, I'm not sure what's going on. We've got something taking up the bandwidth here. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll try to keep going, but we do, do have, definitely have an error on the YouTube side. Facebook is still seems to be functioning okay. Um, but anyway, let's continue forward, though. Hopefully, it'll straighten up and catch up with us. Uh, coming in from the comments real quick, um, let's go ahead and I'm going to bring in Caleb Davis's comment where in talking about the Lord himself, love is patient and God is love. You know, and, and that's one of the things that his people and many of the Psalms kind of talk about the patience, the long suffering of the Lord with his people, not toleration for their sins, but long suffering in that he didn't strike them all dead at any point. Um, he did that one time with Noah, and only eight people, of course, were spared. Um, but then bringing in Andy, uh, Andy's comment, the hard part about the fact nothing bad happens to begin with means that at the end the person ends up in hell and it's too late. Uh, that can actually be a worse situation. That's true. That's absolutely right. But they continue forward despite the warnings, despite the evidences, despite the truth of the Word of God, they still continue forward and he becomes their just judge. Yeah. All right, good point, good point. All right, let's see, any other thoughts or comments on that before we go to this next section here? Hey, you know, John, it's interesting that even with Noah, even with Noah you mentioned him about the destroying the world. Mm -hmm. Even with him, God demonstrated patience. They had 120 years. You yeah, know, yeah. When God made the declaration, you know, uh, or may started. I, I don't know exactly how long Noah took. I don't think it was quite 120 years, but uh, but the point is, is they had time. They were warned, you know. So and so, just keep. But anyways, that's they they were. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, let me see real quick. I'm checking our internet stream. So let's go ahead and be looking ahead to the next section there. Um verses 14, really through the end of the chapter. We're going to look at that here in just a moment. Yeah. Let's see if I can figure out what's wrong here. Real quick, bear with me just a second. John, it just um, uh, you just froze up a moment ago and again, and uh, it popped up that your internet connection is unstable. Okay. My, I I'm guess, I don't know if that's mine or yours, but... It's going to be on my, my end, unfortunately. Let me see. All right, I tell you what, let's do. We'll go ahead. Can y'all still hear me on Zoom? Are we still relatively connected? Okay. And on my side, it's just the upstream. The downstream is great. It's just the the, the up, and that's why y'all maybe get some issues, and why we definitely get some streaming issues. But let's go ahead because we can throw this recording up later. Um, so let's go ahead and read the next section here, and let's see. Tom, if you would start with verse 14, and let's go ahead and read through, well, let's just read verses, well, let's go to the end of the chapter. Okay, all right, and we'll yeah, continue with the New King James Version. Okay. Uh, okay, so verse 14, uh, there is a vanity which occurs on earth that there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said, this also is vanity. So I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night. Then I saw all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. All right. <clears throat> I tell you what I'm going to do here real quick. Let me bring it back here to y'all. And let's see. Hang on a second. There we go. And I'm going to step away and see if I can figure out what's going on in-house that might be causing it. So, um, Tom, you read that. Go ahead and start with verse 14. Give us some thoughts on it. And then, Brian, 
and Paul will just cycle there and keep talking till I get back. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. So, so he basically, you know, he makes the point in verse number 14 and this is, this is dealing with what um, we find all throughout the book over and over and over why there's a challenge. He starts talking about death again. Um, death is the great equalizer, if you will, at least as far as this world is concerned. So that's kind of the point he's making there. And and I think that's the vanity that he's talking about there. And he, and he makes the point that there are just men that it, hap that it happens to like the wicked. Um, and so it, uh, it's also going to happen both ways. Uh, and, and then, of course, he makes the observation in verse 15 where he says, you know, because of that, you know, I commended enjoyment. Uh, you know, man has nothing better to do under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. And I think the point that is being made in that particular statement is, is uh, uh, you know what? God wants us to enjoy life as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he puts boundaries. Um, we need to not be engaged in ungodly activity or the activity of the wicked that are frustrating us. But at the same time, if and when we have the ability to do so, enjoy life to the best of your ability. There's nothing wrong with taking a vacation. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, a, a day or two off a week if you've got that available to you uh, uh, for those types of circumstances. Um, even engaging in a hobby, and I'll add to this, even if there's some money involved in it. You know, I mean, nothing wrong with that, provided you are being responsible and you know your priorities and all those types of things. So I think that's kind of the point he's making. And he says, you know what, as far as this world's concerned, you're only going to be here so long, and then you are going to die. And it doesn't matter whether you're wicked, whether you're righteous. Uh, by the way, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor. It doesn't matter whether you are white or or black or some other color. It doesn't matter your nationality. All those things. Uh, uh, life is here. Make the best of it. So that's kind of my thoughts, at least on the first couple of verses there. So Paul and Brian, if you want to chip in or chime in. Go ahead, Brian. Well, I was just going to say, um, it's, it is very interesting that uh, one of the things he wants us to understand is that that in the course of this vanity, you know, you know, you, you know, we all know people that are so caught up on issues of justice and injustice that they just they can't sleep, they can't rest. Um, we recently did a sermon about this, about the idea that what if I, you know, laid my whole life to pursuing injustice, and then Jesus turns around and says, "Hey." the poor are always going to be with you. In other words, you're never going to fix some issues, uh, injustices. Um, in fact, then then we went on to say that even if you thought you could, even if it was possible, the Bible says it's not, but even if it was possible, uh, the problem is then you die and it goes right back to where it was. And so it makes sense that here in Ecclesiastes, he's saying, you know what? Don't get caught up on that, you know, to, uh, to take enjoyment in your life. Now, what's interesting, Tom, I, I really like what you said, Tom. You said God wants us to enjoy our life, and, and that's an interesting observation. Uh, and I'll, I'll add the second half of that is God doesn't want us to pursue enjoyment for life. In other words, the meaning of life is not pursuing enjoyment. That, in fact, that's going to be the end uh, statement, the summary statement about what the meaning of life is. God wants us to enjoy our labor ironically but but that doesn't mean to pursue enjoyment in fact in fact you can kind of see the difference you know you're you're supposed to enjoy the the things that you're you you have to do um you know which is includes you know whether it's your labor for god and you know for us today being a christian um or whether it's our our labor day to day for our bread you know the work we do god's god says you you should enjoy it you know don't don't uh and, and there are religious movements where um where we see um you know there are religious movements where we see people believe well you ought to you ought to self-harm or you ought to you know take a vow that you know that deprives you of everything and that's completely contrary to the thought process that's going on here you know i i i like all those uh comments as well 
But as I as I read this also, I, I think about, you know, we kind of think about the injustices. Uh, sometimes uh, the government maybe doesn't get things right. But, you know, it is just a part of being being alive here. And I, I like the way uh, the CSB words this uh, verse 14. There's a futility that is done on the earth. There are righteous people who get what the actions of the wicked deserve. And there are wicked people who get what the actions of the righteous deserve. I say that this too is futile. And so, you know, that's just those questions that come up, those philosophical questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, and it's part of living on this earth of life under the sun that things are not always fair. And, uh, you know, we, are, we all like to say and, and call out, that's just not fair. Maybe you've had your kids say that. That's not fair. Well, uh, to say and respond, life isn't fair. I think Solomon agrees here. Life isn't fair. Yep. And again, as we've talked about before, this isn't saying then just give up. You know, basically his conclusion, as we'll see a little bit later here, unless you have already talked about it, is to enjoy your life. You know, especially later on here, enjoy the life with your with your wife. I mean, it's, um, <clears throat> yeah. How far did y'all get? We did two verses. <laughs> yeah, we haven't commented on the last part yet. Uh, verse 16 and 17. That's about par for the course then, isn't it? All right, let's see. <laughs> we saved it for you. So yeah, yeah, John, if you'd have been here, you'd have kept us on track. You know, it is what it that's is. That's a hard. I'm not all this is, but you know what? We enjoyed life while we were talking about it, and also <laughs> we practiced vanity. So there you go, practicing vanity, so you get good at it. Yeah, yeah. You said, you so said par for the course. These things are all vanity except for golf. Golf isn't, <laughs> isn't vanity. <laughs> all right. So continuing then with with this section here, um, let me bring back up here for just a moment verses uh, 16 and 17. What is interesting, he says, when I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, um, then I saw all the works, the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. That's a very, um, I don't wanna say foolish, it is in part, but it's a, it's a vain use of time to try to come and fully understand and know all the work that God has done. You know, we may labor to discover it, but we're not going to find it. Now, it, might there be an argument that in our day and age and generation, we have discovered more oh, yeah. about the works of God? Oh, ab ab absolutely. You know, we've discovered more about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just like, um, and, uh, I think I mentioned this last week or whatever, you know, but just like the one who is maturing in the faith and he's studying the word of God, you know, the more you study the word of God, the more you learn what you don't know, you know, you, or, yeah. or how much you don't know. And, and, and I think that's true with, I think that's true with the world as we advance in our technologies and, and uh, you know, our abilities to understand things. But yet there is just still so much out there that we don't know. And 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 the more you learn, the more you realize there's what you don't know, and what you know. And I and I think that's the way it always going to be. And by the way, that's doubly true when it comes to fully understanding who God is, you know. And yeah, which yeah. goes back to yeah. the question that we're dealing mm -hmm. with in this entire text. You know, the, the, the matter of fact, you could even say all of Ecclesiastes. Why is it vanity? You know, the, the, the futility of why does the wicked prosper? Why do the righteous die? You know, you know, why can't we prolong our life forever and all those things? You know what? Well, the truth is, is you're never uh, you're never going to fully grasp everything about God. And that's why you got to learn to yeah. trust him, which is what faith is about. Well, all right. Let me let me think of or bring up something here real quick. And I, I agree with what you're saying, Tom. I think it's a good point. What was it that who was it? Festus said to Paul in his conversation about Paul's knowledge. Mm, much much learning, learning has driven you mad. Yeah, yeah. yeah much learning has driven you mad. I, I wonder, I, I, for as much as we have discovered, 
if a lot of these discoveries have become a stumbling block and an obstacle to the faith of, of many Christians. Um, and not so much the discoveries in and of themselves, but some of the conclusions that are drawn based on these, the, these little snippets that we have learned about, little pieces of information, people make a mountain out of this little molehill. And that well, becomes something you, that is a stumbling block. One comment I was going to make uh, to build off of what Tom had said is that mm -hmm. what's interesting is that we, a lot of the information, the knowledge that we have gained in the world actually isn't true. Um, in other words, okay. uh, we put a lot of trust in scientists and, and things like that. And, and we should all know, I, I mean, COVID was a wake up call for all of us when all the experts change the story every week you know whenever whenever the the science that everybody was chasing what was never the same for the same month to month and we should say to ourselves and yet people are so trusting in it people were so sure this is this is it and one of the things that i think universally all people fail to recognize is how much information isn't true in other words um you know what so so i love to study history i got my degree in history in fact and one of the things about history is most history that you learn is actually speculation. In other words, it's a, well, you know, I've got this artifact and I've got this thing. If I put them together, I have this story. And we don't appreciate the fact that we know a lot less than we think we do. Um, there, there's more, you know, you know, even something like Roman history, which a lot of people think, well, we know a lot about the Romans. We don't know a lot about the Romans. You know, there's, 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 uh, but we speculate a lot. And then that speculation is put forward as knowledge. And I always remind people, the only truth that's capital T truth, thy word is truth. I mean, the scriptures are the only thing that have a guarantee behind them as information that is 100% accurate. You know, everything else, whether it's politics, whether, you know, and politics is a big one where we get information on politics all the time and we run with it and it's probably not true. Science, history, um, all the things we think we know, most information or a great deal of information is contaminated with bad data. And, you know, I, I, I tell you what, Tom did a whole, uh, Tom, are you still doing your series on evidences? I, I'm wrapping it up. And, wrapping and it up. Talking, How many I'm years have you been talking about this idea, Tom? Because what's interesting is what Tom talks about is the idea of how much what people know, and especially knowledge that 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 in some ways they think shakes their whiz, shakes their faith. How much of that knowledge is fake? Um, and that's that's such a profound idea that, you know, of course, information that contradicts the word of God must not be true. Um, and yet, how many Christians say, oh, look at this fact that makes me doubt my belief. Um, and, and you just, you know, the more you study knowledge, the knowledge of the world, the more you realize these guys don't know what they're talking about. Uh, these guys, and like I said, again, we all got a primer in that in the last few years of the top scientists in our country. Wait a second. I don't think these guys know what they're talking about. Um, it didn't take a very smart person to know that. So I really was thinking about, as we said this, that that's one of the things about applying our mind to knowing everything. Um, I'm getting bad information from the start. So that yeah. it's futile. You know, I just can't know it. I really yeah, yeah, like you know, your use you know, of medical things there. Because we look back, and if you kind of zoom out even further, we laugh, we laugh. Oh, they used leeches on people, you know, or, or go back further in some of the the crazy medical things. And we go, yeah. oh, isn't that hilarious? Lobotomies. Yeah. And, and if this world stands, uh, you know, 100 years from now, people are going to be looking back. Can you believe back in 2023 that people were actually uh, believed this was going to help them, you know, whatever? And I'm not, not picking out anything in particular i'm just saying in general uh and so the pursuit of knowledge and and things we we ought to pursue knowledge but uh, but you're right that uh, we're building on foundations that are kind of shaky sometimes that what we're accepting as facts may not actually be facts but tom i think i stepped over you a little bit there go ahead oh no no, no that's okay uh, we, we were just we were just jockeying for position in line um, yeah yeah, I mean, you know, you know, one of the observations, and like uh, 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 Brian was saying, you know, I'm I'm finishing up with evidences, and and honestly, over the course of the last three to four years, I've devoted at least eighteen months of classes, and that's Sundays and Wednesdays, 
you know, to various aspects of evidences. And a word that comes to mind in all of these discussions, and this goes to what Brian was saying about history, is interpretation is philosophical. There, there is a philosophy associated with it. I mean, uh, even science, the interpretation of science, there's philosophy that is tied to that. But I also remember what, um, and I heard this from a gospel preacher one time, and by the way, his name was J.R. Bronger, and uh, um, he's going to be here this week, coming week. <laughs> uh, but anyways, he was quoting another individual that made this statement. He said, uh, when you look at life, there are, there are questions I cannot answer, but there are also answers that I cannot question. And I think that we, I think that's, that is a great philosophical art. Uh, observation as you go through the book of Ecclesiastes and all these things and when you look at the vanities of pursuing the world without thinking about God and those types of things yeah um, two quick comments from the chat room and then I've got a, a something kind of comical to bring up about Paul what Paul was saying and this goes back a little bit early in our discussion Caleb says, labor is a gift. Just look at those in jail who are happy when they get to work and do things. You know, and that's a good point. And then he also goes on to say speculation equals facts to a lot of people these days. And of course, that is sad. That's right. Um, so, Paul, I was thinking about when you were talking about people looking back here to, in 100 years or what we do today and laughing at it. It reminds me of that Star Trek four. Probably the best of the six Star Trek movies. Some might dispute it with two being better. Uh, yeah. Anyway, in it, you know, they go back in time, of course, to San Francisco when they have to go to the hospital because one of the crew members were injured. And the doctor's going by, and this lady was, you know, kind of in pain, I think waiting for dial dialysis or something other. And he says, Dialysis? Feel like we're in the Stone Ages. And he gives her a little pill and walks away and everything. And that's, that's what happened with every generation. You know, we'll look back 100 years, 200 years at what we do today or thought we knew today, assuming all still stands and grows and realize, wow, we didn't know what we were talking about. But, but that doesn't happen with the scriptures because the scriptures stay constant. Now, man's understanding of things and interpretation of things may change. But when you stick to the word and let the word interpret itself, then you find a greater consistency. All right. Any thoughts or any comments about that? Okay, let's see. It is 1148 and that brings us to the top or I should say the end of chapter eight. Um, <laughs> Caleb says we don't talk about the odd numbered Star Treks. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's right. That's um, exactly right. He knows that. Yeah, yeah. Do we want to go ahead and proceed into chapter nine based on our time? We've got about 10 minutes remaining. Um, we could kind of quick, I say quickly, look at the first six verses there because the conclusion of that is pretty straightforward in what we're looking at. Sound good? Up to you, okay. John. Uh, yeah. Sound John, good? you're running the show, so run it. All right. Mr. Brian, uh, let's see, Paul, Tom, you read last, didn't you? All right. Brian, if you would, let me get you up here and if you would go ahead and read. Let's do one through six of chapter nine. Yeah, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of Ecclesiastes chapter nine, verses one through six. For I considered all this in my heart, so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. All things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good, the clean, the unclean, to him who sacrifices, him who does not sacrifice. As is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath, he who fears an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that, they go to the dead. But for him who is joined to all the living, there is hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, the dead know nothing. 
They have no more reward. They're, the memory of them is forgotten. Also, their love, their hatred, their envy now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Interesting. Wow. All right. Yeah. Kind of depressing, isn't it, Brian? It is if you're pursuing, if if a good and that great experiment, if your whole concept of life is what's right in front of you, uh, which is what he starts off to say, you know, you can't know based on what's in front of you uh, because what's in front of you is a road that comes to an end. Um, and isn't that a neat comment? Uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, you can't know uh, love, hate, you can't know anything by what's in front of you. Um, because what's in front of all of us is, is an end. And so the real things to be known can't be known by all the wisdom of the world. You know, the, it, it, you can't know it except by the things of God there, you know, and I think of a passage like in Hebrews where he says, Hey, the word of God sharper than the double-edged sword, you know, it, it can divide the soul and the spirit. I often say that, that the only knowledge we can have of God and I got to be careful to say we can know there is a God, but to know God, to know that there could be eternal life, something after this, the only way you can know that is by the word of God. And I think that's Solomon's testimony right here. You can't know anything worth knowing by what's right in front of you. And that's true. That's true. It is interesting to note there that in verse three, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that one thing happens to all. And that's, you know. You know what that's a neat that, testimony of is the idea that if there mm -hmm. is no God, then all things are actually evil because of this great injustice, because of the idea yeah. that it, nothing matters, nothing matters. Uh, the, the idea is, uh, uh, you know, that we can't, you know, we, we, there is nothing of value. So it's not that the universe is neither good nor evil if there is no God. Actually, the universe is evil um, because of this concept of, of the absence of anything having any relevance. That's right. Yeah. What is the, um, I don't know if I got the right, right word in mind. Is it entropy? Where well, things kind of de degrade over time? Yeah. 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 Without God, without that's energy? all that we would be left with. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about energy. Yeah. No, entropy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, entropy. Well, entropy is a. a, a I, I, I'm the lesson I'm getting ready to teach on there is a God. I'm doing a review lesson. Mm. I'm okay. uh, one of the arguments for God. You know, uh, does uh, somebody had to kick it, kick it, kickstart it, if 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 you want to say. It. I mean, is the laws of ther thermodynamics, which is which has to do with energy, and entropy is the word that you would use to describe energy is constantly degrading that's it yeah. yeah yeah that's it and and so this goes back to what brian was saying there that but without god it'd just be all wickedness there would be no benefit whatsoever to the world in which we live and how that we all come to the same end and again this this harkens back to we have to remember that he's focusing here at this moment on life without god fundamentally you know, if, if you're so worried about life and how you're going to live it and the good and bad things, understand it all comes to a screeching halt one day. You know, so don't lose yourself in that worry. Focus on serving the Lord. And that'll be the end, ultimate end there. You know, there's a fundamental difference in the way people should live or do live who recognize that there is eternity versus those who believe that uh, once you're dead, you're dead and uh, the idea of survival of the fittest uh, that's part of that idea that you know once you're dead that that's all there is to you uh, you, you treat people differently you you handle yourself differently you, your morals and ethics are different um, it, it's just uh, it's just a total totally different um, way of thinking and living. I mean, if you thought you weren't held accountable for anything, uh, what would you do to have the things that you would like to have? If you thought, I've got 70 or 80 or 90 years here on this earth, and what am I going to do to have and, and to enjoy and to do all these things? If once I'm dead, I'm gone. That's all there is. 
And I think that's why it says here, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun. One thing happens yeah. to all. Uh, when people only only recognize that one thing, uh, it results in uh, in evil. That's right. That's a good point. Well, let's throw this one at Brian. The The next comment I'm about to read, this one comes in from Jerry. And Brian said, or Jerry writes, is the universe evil when creation was called good? I was just, I was just putting a comment about that because that's a neat comment. Uh, so God makes man, he says it's good, or God makes the creation, it's good. God makes man, he says it's very good. But what's fascinating is why, so why is, why is Solomon say it's evil? Well, Solomon says what's evil is the concept of death. Now, yeah. I, I kind of like that you brought up entropy, John, because entropy is death in a universal sense. So what's neat about that is that it was very good, and then death was introduced. Romans chapter 5 says that through one man, death came into the world. So here, here's the introduction of death, and it transforms the creation from very good to what Solomon is saying is evil. Now, I'm going to be careful to say, by the way, Solomon, Solomon's observation of it being evil, I want to be clear, is only in the context of if this is all there is, it's evil. So in other yeah. words, if this life, and Paul says that in, Roman, in 1 Corinthians 15, right? If in this life only we have hope, we're, most, we're the most pitiable of men. Uh, that's, a, that's a, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, the world is absolutely evil. But because there's the offer of eternal life, that actually that actually invalidates this whole conversation to a degree because yeah. the concept is there then becomes things that are good you know whatever is good whatever is noble think on these things there are good things uh, the church the word uh fellowship uh you know all, all these different things those are good you know those are things that are not good those are things that are fantastic that 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 make life worth living you know because of the the hope that we have our, our hope um it, 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 that's a neat thing to think of it itself. Our hope alone transforms what is evil to what is good. So um, I got to be careful to say, you know, there is a change in the world when when man sins and death is introduced. And Solomon's observation is, if that's all there is, then it's evil. But Solomon's not going to. Solomon's conclusion isn't going to be and the end he's not saying close it up here guys i have you know uh, the saddest thing ever he's going to say you know what the meaning of life then becomes to fear god and keep his commandments because of the accounting now now that's that's actually the most profound part of that statement because we give an accounting to god resurrection judgment the next life solomon absolutely believes in that yeah. he just is saying that without that there's no value Without, yeah. without, if you don't live your life with, you know, who said it a minute ago? Was it Paul? Uh, if you don't have the eternity mindset, then your life is vanity. <clears throat> if you don't have an eternity mindset, then your life is meaningless and evil mm -hmm. and pointless and futile. But if you have an eternity mindset, that's everything. So, uh, yeah, Jerry's comment is real neat there because it 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 kind of connects some important ideas that really fit right here in what we're talking about. That's right. Yeah. And next week, when we continue there in chapter nine, we're going to kind of get into the therefore, you know, not quite the future therefore, like you're talking about with the judgment of God, but, you know, enjoy your life, you know, knowing the brevity and the wickedness of it from that context that we're looking at. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's go ahead and plan to pause here. Any, any final thoughts or comments on this from uh, Paul or Tom or Brian? All right, so let's see. <clears throat> Let me bring this up here real quick. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for our study today. If you'd like to contact us, you can do it several different ways. Our email address is questions at truthfactorlive.com, or you can write us all individually as the email address is there seen on the screen, john at, paul at, et cetera, truthfactor.com, or contact us via social media. Our Facebook page is Truth Factor Live. Our YouTube channel is also Truth Factor Live, and we do have a Twitter handle, and it's Truth Factor Live. So we'd love to hear from you, hear what you have to say about things. If you have any questions or comments that maybe you'd like for us to consider in a future study, send them our way as well, and we'll put them in the list and um, look at them once we're done with our study of Ecclesiastes. Maybe if they relate to our study of Ecclesiastes, well, then we'll bring them in next week in our study. Alrighty, well that's all for now. So gentlemen, let's everyone say goodbye. 
And we'll see everyone back here again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Standard Time or Central Daylight Time at Truth Factor Live. Have a great week.